Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be reviewing Kalimala. This game was designed by Fabio Lopiano, and in it, players take on the role of cloth merchants in Florence, and they utilize an innovative action selection mechanic that allows them to get more bang for their buck depending on the amount of opponents that jump on and want to copy what they've already done. As they play the game, players will compete in numerous different areas, from shipping cloth to various cities, as well as building the beautiful cathedrals in Florence. First, I'll show you how the game plays in a little more detail, and then I'll jump into my review. Out here in the middle of the table, we have the main board for Kalimala, and the first thing I'd like to show you is this 3x3 grid over here. Now, these are all actions that you'll be taking throughout the game, and it's worth noting that all of the perimeter actions are shuffled up and randomly put out each game, but the middle one is printed on. And then up here, we have the uh, city council, and each one of these tiles is also randomly put out at the beginning of each game. Next up, we have this map over here, which shows some of Europe, and we are all in Florence right here, but what this shows is that we can send uh, cloth over land to these three cities and by boat to these three over here, and lastly, up at the top, we have these four buildings. Now, these three are cathedrals that are getting built in Florence, and uh, we don't just make cloth. We're also going to be donating uh, resources to the construction of these cathedrals to help uh, bolster up our uh, prestige as a guild, and uh, lastly, over here, the city council, it's already built but you can hang some art on its walls. Down here, we can see that this is a three-player game, and each person has a player board. And let's now talk about how a turn works, and it's quite simple. The uh, starting player token is right here, and the starting player is going to take one of their action discs, most likely one of their own color for the beginning of the game, and they're going to put it out onto this action grid. When we look a little closer at this area, we can see the 12 different circles, each of which are between two of the nine actions. And what you do is you place your disc down onto one of those, whether or not it is empty or has somebody else's disc on it. At the beginning of the game, it will all be empty, and one of the easiest things we can do is put down right here. And the moment you put your disc down, the first thing you do is activate both of the actions that are adjacent to that disc in any order you want. Now, these two are very basic actions. This one just says you gather a brick, and this one says you gain a marble. When we come back to the player's board, we can see a wood, brick, and marble warehouse. They're all empty at the moment, so in order to generate a brick, you simply take one of your cubes, and you're going to put it down into your warehouse, and then same thing goes for the marble. So these cubes are different based on where they are, and with that, the green player is done with their turn. The next player clockwise might go here, and the player after that may go over here, and now it is once again the green player's turn. They can play one of their action discs, and again, it could be either a one of their color or one of these white ones, but I'll talk about the white ones in just a minute. So now they have quite a few options. They could go down onto one of these empty spots or on top of a spot that already has another player. So in this case, let's say they go down right over here. In this case, the first thing that happens is we will get to evaluate both actions as normal, but once we're done with our turn, the blue player will then get to evaluate both of these actions as if they had just put their token down. And if there was a third disc underneath here, they would also get to evaluate those again, even if it was, say, our disc or the blue player's disc. So uh, first of all, let's go ahead and gather these things up. This is going to get us a wood, but this is going to allow us to build something at the workshop. Gathering wood is easy. We just take a cube and put it down here. But when we go to the workshop, we actually have three different things that we can build. The first thing is we can build a boat, and that will cost us two wood. We can build a trading house as our second option for two brick. Or our third thing is we could spend a wood and a brick in order to build another silk warehouse. Now, if you look along the top here, we only have one silk warehouse, but we have two new locations. And whenever you evaluate an action, if you have the ability to do that action, you must do that action. So we don't actually have a choice. We must spend our wood and our brick in order to build a new silk warehouse, which we can put right up here. And now, as I mentioned before, with our turn over, the blue player would get to evaluate both of these actions. At this point, let's run through a couple more example turns so that I can explain the rest of these actions before we move on. And the next one will be right down here. Now, this action is going to allow us to gather up some cloth, and this one lets us send out a caravan. With a single cloth action, you're going to take one cube and put it down into each one of your cloth warehouses. So the single action generated two cloth for ourselves because we already built this extra warehouse. Next up, we have our caravan action, and you'll notice this icon matches these three cities out here on the map. Now, the thing is, you can only send cloth to one of these cities if you already have a trading house in that city. And in fact, for each caravan action, you can send one cloth from your warehouses into that city. So in this case, we could take the two cloth we just generated and put them both down like that. Or if we had had two of these trading houses like this, we could put both of them down here. And if you remember, you build a trading house by spending two brick when you do the warehouse action. But in this case, we actually don't have any trading houses at all as we're evaluating this action, which means we can't do anything with it. 
Well, fortunately for us, there is this deck of cards over here, and the way this works is whenever you do an action and you cannot do the action, because maybe you're trying to gather bricks, but you have four bricks in your warehouse already and you can't put a fifth one in, or you're trying to do a caravan action, but you don't have any trading houses or any silk to send, well, you'll simply draw the top card from the deck, and it is going to be an action that matches one of these nine out here on the board. In fact, we started the game with one of these, uh, in this case, a workshop tool, and th this is part of setup. You get to draft these from a hand, but I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, the way it goes with these action cards is you can spend as many of these as you want to at any point whenever you're taking actions. So that means you are not necessarily just going to do the actions from your disc. I could place something down and then spend this to generate a marble and then spend this to do a workshop action in between or before or after the main actions that I might be wanting to do on my turn. So whenever you can't do an action, you essentially get a random bonus action for later on in the game. Okay, it's time for our next example turn, and we could go up here, and this is going to allow us to do a sailing action and a making art action. For sailing, we can come back to the map and we notice that this icon matches these three city spots and this means that we can ship to these locations and the only way that you can ship is if you have built boats. Now the thing about boats is that they go down here into your own canal. So if we had one boat, we would put it right here and it's not associated with any one of these spots, but whenever you do this uh, shipping action, then you get to deliver one silk for each one of these boats that you have and you can send those to any of the port cities. So if we had all three of our boats deployed, we could send uh, three silk to the single city or three different cities if we wanted to. But uh, once again, in this case, we don't have any boats built. So for this action, we just draw another one from the top of the deck and it looks like <laughs> we get a make art action, which is actually the other option that we did with our disc. So let's go ahead and talk about that. If we look back over to the left hand side of our board, which is a cheat sheet for all of the nine actions, we can see that we can spend one marble in order to make an art. And we do have a marble, which means we are forced to do this. So this goes back into our supply. And then we take a cube out of our supply and put it down into the art section on one of these four structures. So in this case, perhaps we would go ahead and put it right there. Let's now come back to the action grid for the final example, and for this one, let's use a white disc. Now, you may have noticed that uh, all three of the players have these white discs, and that's because they are a neutral color. And whenever you put these down, you get a double activation. So instead of just activating each thing that is adjacent to the disc once, in this case, we get to do it twice. And uh, you could actually do it uh, as in one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, or just staggering them back and forth as much as you want. And in this case, we know how the brick works already. That's going to generate us two brick with this one white place which we put down into our warehouse and then we finally get to do the contribute action in this case twice because of our white disc and if you look on the action you see some wood brick or marble this means that for each activation you're going to take a wood brick or marble from your warehouse and put it down into one of the available spots in these three cathedrals that are being built so in this case we have two brick so we could put both of them right here if we wanted to or we could split them up like that and like that if it made more sense for us with all of these actions now explained, it's now time to talk about what happens when the stack of discs gets into its fourth level. So I mentioned before that when you put a disc down, you evaluate the top, the second one, and the third one. But in this case, we have four, so we will evaluate the top three. But when we get down to the fourth, it will not evaluate as an action. Instead, we are going to kick this out and put it down onto the next available scoring tile in the city council. So you always start at the top and on the left, so we would put it right here, and immediately we would do a brick scoring. Evaluating it is easy, and I've gone ahead and added a couple more cubes for this example. You add up all of the cubes of each player in the brick line for all three of the cathedrals under construction, and whoever has put the most cubes in is going to get three points, the second most cubes is going to get two points, and the third most cubes is going to get one point, although you do have to add something. So in this case, the purple player did not put any in, and they're not going to get that third place point, but we also notice that blue has two, and we also have two, so we're in a tie. In this case, we come back to the city council over here and we count up the number of discs on the different scorings as well as the cubes in the art area. So if, for instance, we had had one cube, we'd put one piece of art in the city council, then we would have one and the blue player would once again have one. We would be tied again, in which case we would ignore the art and then see whoever has the most discs out here. So in this case, the blue player is winning the second tiebreaker, or of course, if I had not cheated there, blue would easily win it because it would be uh, more of their colored uh, items in the city hall than we do and so that means blue wins it they're going to get one two three points we will get two and then of course purple would not get any points because they had no cubes in the brick areas when this disc went down 
Once the scoring is completed, you once again move on to the next player's turn. And as you can see, there are a variety of different scoring options. You might have some that are specific to cities, like this says London and this says Troyes. Well, that just means you add up all of the cloth in London when that one scores, or Troyes when that one specifically scores. You also have situations where you have like this boat, which is just you add up all of the cloth on all of the port cities. And then you get the three points, two points, and one point, uh, just like before. And then, of course, you have the specific cathedrals, like this one right here. That is this one right here, and you would add up all of your cubes in the wood, brick, marble, and the art area, and then once again, see who has the most, and score those three, two, and one points. So, players will continue taking turns around and around the table until one of two endgame conditions are met. The first is every player will have spent all of their action discs, and this is going to vary depending on the player count. In the three-player game, you have 15 of these discs available to you, and then in the four- and five-player game, you have less discs, so that the game will be a similar-ish amount of actions total, or the game will end once all 15 of these scorings have been evaluated, at which point you will keep playing until you get back to the starting player token. Once the game has reached its end, players will generate some end-game points. The first is, if the game ended because players used all of their discs and not because all of the scorings happened, then you will evaluate every one of the scorings in order so that every time you play the game, you will always score everything. So in this case, we would immediately score Lisbon, then San Minatio, and then Hamburg, and then we go into the other uh, endgame scoring, which involves this card right here, which you may have noticed. Now, there are 10 of these cards in the game, and at the very beginning of the game, as part of setup, you deal out two or three of these to each player, depending on the player count, and they're going to choose one and have it face down in front of themselves all game long. And depending on the player count, you might also have one of these face up all game long as well. So when you get to the end of the game, you will put this one right up here, and then everybody will reveal the cards that they've been holding, and you're going to put them up here as well. These are not personal objectives, they're just hidden information that you know, and at this point you will then evaluate each one of these, but instead of getting 3, 2, and 1 point like normal with the scorings, each one of these is 5 points, 3 points, and 1 point, and you will just evaluate them like normal using the same tiebreakers, so it's just uh, evaluating to see how many cubes are on this cathedral, this cathedral, as well as Lisbon and Troyes in this case, and once you add up all of those extra victory points, you check to see who has the most, and they're the winner. Let's now begin the review for Kali Mala by starting off with a few positive points. And the first of these has got to be discussing that innovative action selection mechanic. You've got these nine seemingly simplistic actions in that grid, like it might be um, gather a wood or donate a brick or spend a marble to put an art out onto the board. But the ramifications of figuring out where to put that one disc down give you a wonderful variety of great decisions. Uh, the first thing that you're considering is just, well, what do I need right now? You know, you don't want to go onto a spot that doesn't help you out in the slightest. But the second thing to consider is, what will this do for your opponents? Like, if I really want this spot and I go there, but it helps my opponents out even more than it helps me, well, then maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should do something else. Perhaps I go onto a spot where I already am so that I get to do multiple activations of this uh, particular combination that might be good for me right now. But on top of all of these things is considering where do you think your opponents are going to go in the future? So you obviously don't want to help them out by putting your token down, but if you think that's a really hot spot, then you go there and maybe other people will go on top of you. And in particular, in the earlier parts of the game where there are uh, so there's a somewhat clear board, you really want to focus on figuring out where the good spots are that will be activated multiple times because you want to get your tokens onto the bottom of the four stack as quickly as possible to get them over into the city council and it's going to activate the scorings, but more importantly, bolster your position to win tiebreakers. And ties are humongously important in this game. There's a reason why the rule have, rules have like uh, six layers of tiebreakers or something crazy like that, but the number one one is just have the most discs and um, art cubes down in the city council area. So you might actually find yourself going onto a spot that's okay for you, but not great, but you're going there because you can tell that everyone else is going to want to go there multiple times and it will end up cashing that disc out so that you will get multiple activations for it, you know, up to a maximum of three. But the ideal thing is three activations and a disc over there onto the city council. The last thing, of course, you're considering is that you have two different types of discs. You have your own color discs, and then you have these white double activator discs. And you um, have a varying amount of those based off of the player counts, but these white discs are really potent. If you put that down onto a spot where you already have some stuff, you might have an explosive turn. Like I've seen um, it happen before where they, uh, somebody puts it down there, they get two for the white, and then they also have two more down there, activating four times, which could give just a ton of resources and cards and all that type of good stuff. 
But the interesting thing with the white uh, tokens is that you get the two activations and that's it. It's a max of two and minimum of two, whereas the color tokens are a minimum of one and a maximum of three, which means they have a higher um, uh, ceiling. So uh, it just all these great decisions come into play, like what token do I play and where do I play it and when do I play it, all comes out of this seemingly simple grid of nine easy to evaluate actions. For positive point number two, I'd like to discuss the 15 different races that you are essentially competing in every time you play the game. You've got uh, all these little uh, 15 tokens, you shuffle them up, you put them out on the board, and it'll provide you with a different racetrack, so to speak, for each play. Now, it's enjoyable trying to figure out how that random set of tokens is going to dictate the game, as well as every single decision that you are making. Uh, because if you look out there and you notice that maybe all of the port cities are evaluating really early in the game, then you're gonna be much more motivated to try and pick up some wood and build some ships to get silk out to those as quickly as possible to get points for them when they score, versus if all the ships are really late game, maybe you don't get ships out at all, or just one or two versus a whole bunch of ships, depending on where all these things are aligned in that overall grid. And it's great the way that um, many of these spots, well, every single spot, gets scored multiple times. You know, the cathedrals, uh, each one's going to get scored for the most wood, the most brick, the most marble, and art. And then the cathedral itself, you know, of course, the wood, brick, marble, that's for all of the cathedrals. But it means you put one brick down into a cathedral, and that is going to help you scoring for the overall bricks as well as the cathedral itself. And it means you can run multiple races at once, which is good, because 15 is a lot of different races to be running. So you want to be able to synergize, be as efficiently as possible to play as well as you can in as many of those as possible. And it's, of course, good to win these, but I've also seen uh, players be very successful kind of streamlining and just getting a lot of second place finishes um, as opposed to another player who maybe gets a couple first places and then doesn't even score in some of the other ones. So you definitely want to balance all these together. And I think it's just a, a wonderful mechanic, just having all of those different things that you're going to score and having them shuffled up. It works really well. For positive number three, let's now discuss the pacing and overall length of the game and why I think both of these are spot on. When it comes to the pacing, it starts out nice and slow. You know, you're putting a token out, then you're putting another token out, things are kind of trickling up. Maybe one particular spot is very good, so on the fourth or fifth round, a single scoring happens, but you will likely usually be well over the halfway point on, before you get a significant number of these uh, activations happening. And near the end of the game, you can't not activate. Like almost every single spot is maxed out at three discs. So no matter what you wanna do, you're gonna go down and it's gonna initiate a scoring, which means you have a lot of time to prepare in the early game. You know, things are nice and slow, but at the end of the game, when things are consequential and hurried and fast, you, you don't. Like you have to just do the best you can, another scoring happens, do the best you can, and just it races through, maybe three scorings will happen before your next turn. And it's just something you have to deal with. And I think it's a great ramp up of pain Pacing. It really works, especially when you consider how short this game is. Like, I was expecting a 90-minute experience, and what I got was a 60-minute experience. Um, the three-player game I played was definitely under 60 minutes even, and there's just a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to the amount of uh, time. I guess a bang for your minutes <laughs> in this case. Like, it's definitely a quicker game than I expected, but that was not a problem. In fact, it was a very pleasant surprise at how satisfying and engaging and um, uh, deep the game is for its 60 or so minute playtime. All right, next up, let's talk about a couple neutral points. And the first of these is the card draw mechanic. Now, uh, if you remember, this is every time you do an activation and you do not have the ability to activate it, you draw a random card from the top of the deck, put it into your hand, and it is a uh, action that you can do at any point in the future when you are doing other actions. And it is essentially a random action. It's any one of the nine uh, actions that are printed on the board. It's like the game is letting you bank an action. Like it's like a rain check. It's like, oh, well, you couldn't do that now. Take a random one and hopefully you can do something with it later. And from my personal perspective, I think this is a brilliant mechanic. I almost put this in as a positive point because I think that uh, it allows you to put yourself in situations where you get a bunch of activations where you can't actually get stuff because you intentionally want to mine down into that uh, card deck to try and get something that really works for you. And it allows you, um, because it's um, very unrestrictive, to have humongous turns. And by unrestrictive, I mean you can play as many cards as you want in your turn and you can hold as many cards as you want. There's no hand limit. So you are somewhat incentivized to get a big hand and then you will occasionally have a turn where you're like, okay, I do this and this and this and this and this and this and those are just 
really satisfying turns. But the flip side to this, and the reason why this is a neutral point, is because I have also seen this aggravate people. You know, this is card draw luck. It's random, it's from the top of the deck. And if you have no trade houses and you keep drawing the caravan action into your hand, that is going to be aggravating. And to a certain extent, my perspective is this forces tactics onto the players. It says, well, if you keep drawing caravans, maybe you should build some trade houses. You know, that's the game forcing you out of your comfort zone. You know, maybe you are playing the game and you're like, well, I see the different uh, scorings and I, um, you know, based off of how it goes, I think I'm just going to go with ships, not really worry about trade houses, but I keep drawing these cargo cards. Well, you know what? Let's get a trade house or two built because I have the reason to do that in playing these cards. First of all, people won't expect it. Uh, we had one game where uh, Jessica actually played four shipping uh, cards at once. She had this hand of like seven cards, four of them were shipping. She had a single ship, but she shipped four times with it. It caught everybody by surprise and she made a good amount of points with that action. And she only built that ship because she kept drawing those ship cards. And to a certain extent, you can lament the fact that you're just having bad card draw luck. But on the other side, I like the game pushing players towards actually needing to deal with the luck that they got. But that being said, you can win or lose this game on the luck of the draw. The first game I played, I lost because my opponent pulled the one out of nine cards that would um, allow them to do a thing on their last turn. And so that is something you need to keep in mind and why it's ultimately a neutral. I think this will turn some people off. Although for me, I think it is a wonderful addition to the game. Next up, we have neutral number two, and for this one, I'd like to talk about the artistic aesthetic of this game. It really seems like the design directive here was make this game look like the epitome of all things Euro. <laughs> You've got this uh, big board. It's got like eight different shades of brown on it. You've got kind of a hand-drawn map. You've got different uh, cubes and discs in various colors, and it really does feel comfortable to me. Like, I play a lot of Euro games, and I think this is a great representation of an art aesthetic, of a Euro art aesthetic. Like, it it works, like, the, the colors, they all pop off the board with the cubes and the discs, because the board is kind of so drab looking. You know, it's well done, but just a bunch of brown, but it feels like that was intentional so that the vibrant cubes and discs pop off and you're easy, it's easy to analyze them. But all that being said, if you're somebody who is used to more thematic games with vibrant illustrations and you're throwing a lot of dice around, and then you walk by a table of people playing Kalimala, you might be shocked um, as to why everybody isn't asleep <laughs> just based off of the uh, art aesthetic that's going on here. So it definitely seems like this one is playing towards its base, and I think it works. I do like how the game looks. Moving on, we now have the negative section, and I just have one to talk about here. And this is going to sound like a little bit of a nitpick, but uh, hear me out. So we have these endgame scoring cards that are hidden. Uh, everybody is going to get two of them at the beginning of the game. They're going to choose one, discard the other. And when the game is over, you reveal all of them and everybody scores these. So they are public objectives, but you have some hidden information as to what is going to be scoring. And the issue that I have is that not all of these uh, cards feel like they are created equal. Now, every single one of them scores the same. It's uh, five points for the person who has the most in that uh, hidden scoring, three points for the second, and uh, one point for the third. The problem is that for some of these, they are, well, for four of them in particular, they are the uh, cathedral areas. Well, three of them are cathedrals, one is for the, um, the city council. And if you pick a cathedral, then that cathedral is going to score five times. You have the uh, cathedral scoring, you've got marble, wood, brick, and art scoring. So that's five different times that you have a reason to be putting a cube down into that cathedral. Versus if maybe you pick up one of the other six cards, which are the three port cities or the three inland trading cities, those only score twice. They score once for the city itself and then once for either all ships or all caravans. And that's it. So that means it's a lot harder to sneak cubes into these cities to maintain control. And depending on how the 15 tokens come out at the beginning of the game, you might really find yourself in a bind. Like, you know, obviously it's good to win those things. So maybe you try to go hard on them early to take first place and then just leave it with first place until the end of the game because nobody suspects a thing. But that's not always how these things are going to work themselves out. And it's very hard to disguise that you have one of these um, a port or trading cities um, versus the cathedrals. You know, we had a game where the shipping had already scored and the actual city had already scored. And one of my opponents kind of slyly tried to sneak a cube into that city, hoping nobody would notice. And I saw that and immediately knew what their hidden scoring uh, information was. And, you know, they knew that they were broadcasting that. They were hoping that nobody would notice. But for me, I had one of the cathedrals. So it was so easy to maintain control in that one spot and not have it look 
as obvious because it just looked like, hey, I'm just trying to win the art uh, thing. And oh, hey, look, I'm just trying to win the wood one. And you know, I'm of course not trying to dominate it because I don't want it to be too obvious. And also you don't want to be too inefficient with your cubes. But you know, you have these 10 different objectives and it just, it's a bit of a bummer to me that four of them just feel better than the other six. And you know, if I get two of these in my hand and one of them is uh, a building and one is a city, it's just, it's easy for me. I'm just going to take one of the cathedrals and I wish the game had been designed in such a way that it was not so hard to potentially disguise you trying to take over uh, one of those other cities. So again, it feels like a nitpick, but honestly, it also kind of feels like a flaw to me. So that's uh, honestly the only problem I've found with this game. Up next, let's talk about the variability for Kalimala. And I think that it's pretty much what I expected going in. Uh, you don't have anything uh, new swapped in or out from uh, game to game. You always have those same uh, set of actions. You always have those same races, uh, the competitions that you're doing. But just the act of shuffling up the actions and shuffling up those uh, competitions is going to make one game play pretty different from the next. And then, of course, you have the hidden information of what the uh, secret uh, public goals are going to be at the end, which is going to um, subtly dictate how you play this game to the next. Like if you keep one of the uh, trading cities, maybe you go a little bit harder on trying to get trade houses out because winning one of those is fine. Five victory points and five is a lot in this game. So yeah, I've been um, quite pleased with the variability of this game. I don't think it's um, exceptionally huge, but it's definitely as much as I would have expected and it has made the game feel different from one play to the next. When it comes to player counts, Kalimala supports three to five players, which in and of itself is a little bit unusual because most games support two players, uh, specifically Euro games. So I haven't even heard of a variant for two, but I can say that I've played three, four, and five, and I think that four player is best. The three player game was great, honestly. The only issue with it compared to the four player game is that everybody can kind of score for everything because whenever you score any of those competitions, it does first, second, and third. So that means in a three-player game, all you need is one cube anywhere to get that kind of free one victory point versus in a four-player game, you have to compete. Like uh, even one cube isn't necessarily going to be enough. Uh, one person is going to be left out of every single one of the scorings. And I think that's why that is the ideal way to play the game. I did play a five-player game and it worked. It was fine. Um, it was pretty darn chaotic though. And having four different actions before or your next turn means especially at the late game when things really take off that might be like three or four scorings before you have another turn and you just you don't have as much control so i don't think i necessarily super recommend the five player game like it worked i don't think you should avoid it but uh four player is absolutely the sweet spot and the place where you should play this game the most um and it did work just fine at three i don't really see a problem with three at all so three and four are the best ways to play this one four in particular in conclusion, I've played Kalimala three times at this point, and this game has really impressed me. Uh, in particular, the three and four player game that I played, I really enjoyed those experiences, and I went into this game expecting it to be okay. I was definitely intrigued to see how that action selection mechanism was going to work, but I was a bit um, hesitant about the 15 different competitions that you'd be running because in general, I don't really love games that are heavy on area majority and just having more than your opponents. And that is all that this game is. It's just 15 competitions of trying to have more than your opponents. But an interesting thing happens here where when you have so many of these competitions and you have some of them happen early and you have others that you could plan for pretty much the whole game, it makes each one feel less impactful, less important, and less stressful. And realistically, this is a marathon game where you're trying to do as good as you can over a broad stretch of 15 different competitions. So you don't really sweat too bad when you were in a really good spot and somebody just kind of totally wiped you out of that location. Well, maybe you lost a point or two and you might lose the game by a point or two, but it just doesn't feel as consequential and mean. And I think that's why I don't like area majority games in general. But for this one, it has definitely won me over. In fact, I am not just tolerating that aspect of the game. I think it is a really great aspect of the game. It adds a lot of fun, a lot of great decisions uh, for me, a person who doesn't generally like that. I think part of it is also the multiple ways in which a single cube can get scored. You know, depending on where it is, it'll get scored between two and five different times, which means you really need to think about the impact and the efficiency of these cubes as you're putting them down. And then when it comes to the uh, action selection, I just think it's brilliant. I think it works so well. It's such a great idea where it has this 
um, a worker placement vibe, but it isn't really. It's action selection because you put your worker down, but then other people can go on top of it, and they are disincentivized to do that because it helps you out. But if they just need to do a thing, well, then they're going to do it, and it's great getting stuff when it's not your turn. And in Kalimala, if you play things right, you are constantly getting stuff when it's not your turn. You're playing on other people's turns, which makes downtime much less of a problem, especially at the higher player counts. You know, it might be a little bit till it comes back to you, and there can be some analysis paralysis, especially on the last couple turns of this game. I've seen, like, the last last action take like many minutes as somebody processes all of the ramifications of where this single disc is going to go down, but then they put that down and then maybe you get to jump in there as well. So I don't think that the downtime is necessarily a problem, and a big part of that is jumping in on other people's turns. So yeah, in general, this game has really impressed me. I think it looks very comfortably Euro-y out on the table, and I have just enjoyed my experiences with this game. I think it has the feeling of a bit of a classic. Like, you know, the, the mechanics themselves are very streamlined. It's an elegant game. Everything kind of feeds back in on itself, you know, with the actions um, uh, kicking a disc out onto the scorings. And when you teach this game, there's kind of a moment where you go, and that's it. So let's start playing. And everyone's like, oh, that's it. Okay, well, let's go. And then um, they dive into it and they find that there is some wonderful complexity and depth here, even though it is just a series of rather simple things that just work really well to, uh, with each other. So uh, yes, I heartily recommend this game. I think I think it's uh, wonderful and I hope it gets a uh, broader distribution. I'm not sure how available it is in general because again, I did pick this up uh, from Germany at Essen Spiel. But if you have a chance to give this one a shot, I heartily recommend you give it a go. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel through Patreon, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do so at patreon.com slash johngetsgames, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to see more in-depth board game reviews like this one, as well as full game playthroughs and vlogs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.